what a great memorial service that it was in a celebration of uh, a dear brother. Uh, there's kind of an empty spot with us here today, but yet we rejoice uh, in the fact that we know where he is. And we're thankful for the life that Brother Jim lived, for the example that he was to his family, for the example that he was to many of you, to me, uh, in this congregation. He will be missed, uh, but we know that we will see him again someday. I want to thank everybody that worked so hard yesterday, uh, Sarah and her crew in the kitchen. I appreciate all of your work, as I know Nancy does. Uh, I appreciate Dave and the song service that he uh, led us in yesterday. Just so many people. We thank you for that. Uh, I know that Jim would have been uh, very proud uh, of the things that were mentioned and talked about about him. Maybe a little bit embarrassed, too. I don't know. But... Uh, Indeed, our prayers, Nancy, are with you. Uh, you know that we love you, uh, and we're always going to be there for you. And I hope that you can know that you can lean on us. I appreciate Dave leading the song that we just sang. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to Mark uh, chapter 4, that song was written about a story that takes place in Mark chapter 4. And that's going to be the emphasis of our lesson this morning. As I've told you many times in the past, any time in the Bible that you read a story or if you have a Bible, if you've read Houston's article this morning, if you have a Bible with a red letter edition, those are the words of Christ. And when you see those, I think you should give those the attention that they deserve. Jesus, when he did things, when he said things, they just weren't idle conversation. He was doing teaching. He was showing his power uh, anytime that we see him being brought up in the Bible. Here in this gospel account, you can find it in Matthew. You can also find it in Luke. John doesn't record it because John only wrote about things that he was an eyewitness to. So obviously he wasn't there watching this. But we have this wonderful story that takes place in the life of Jesus and in the life of calling those to follow him, specifically his apostles. And we see this event. And as we sang in the song, the song kind of brings out the idea that when Jesus rebukes the sea and he says, peace be still. Uh, and the beauty of that to where, you know, they're absolutely just amazed that the seas and the winds would obey his voice. And you see, they're slowly figuring out just as we read that, as we study the Bible, they're slowly figuring out that this man who's making the claim to be God in the form of, of a man, the son of God, does have the power over all of the world. Can you imagine if you were there and you're very concerned and you see all of this, these things taking place, even to the point that says they were feel, fearful for their own life? And in a sense, they rebuke him, and he in turn rebukes the wind and the sea, and instantly, instantly we see that it was calm. In your Bibles there, let's read this short account, beginning in verse 35. Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 35. On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose and the, we the waves beat against the boat so that it was already feeling. But he was, I can't see. My, my, my uh, bifocals, I can't get which way I want to go. I've, I've got the solution. And he was in the stern asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, you, do you not care that we are perishing? And then he arose, and he rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How was it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly 
and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? There are three questions that are asked in this particular section of the Bible in relationship to this event that's taking place. And I want us to pay very particular attention to these three questions this morning. The first one being is they go to Jesus, they awaken him, he's asleep in the front of the boat, and they ask the question, do you not care, Lord, that we are dying? Do you not even, can you not even stay awake and die with us? It's what I read into the story. We know they're fearful. We know they're concerned about what's going on. The waters are coming in. Uh, Matthew's account and Luke's account says, do you not care that we are dying? Uh, that we are at a point to where we're going to, as the song would say, we're going to perish and we're going to, we're going to be buried in the bottom of this sea. And you don't even care. You're not even worried enough. You know, what's the parallel of that to us in our world today? I believe that Jesus not only taught them lessons, I believe Jesus taught us lessons. I believe the Bible is living and active and the words are just as important then, they're just as important today because I believe there's a message for us there. So what's the message in that for us today? Have you ever been to a point in your life where you're going through some kind of trial or some kind of tribulation? And have you ever, I mean, honestly, ask yourself, God, why aren't you helping me through this? Have you ever been to that point? I think many of us could probably say, we may not have come out and said that exact words, but have you been to a point at times where you've just wondered what could possibly, what good could possibly come from this? I mean, what good can happen in my life to where it's going to work out? And God, what can you possibly have in mind for me with this event? I believe that God, there's a purpose for everything. I believe that that's part of my faith. And I believe that there is a reason for everything. And I believe that God can use everything for the good uh, of all of us in our life if we look for those things. Many times I'm sure we've prayed, God, hear my prayer. God, answer my prayer. Know this, brethren, God does hear your prayers. And God does answer your prayers. Now, the hard part of that is he may not answer them the way that you want them to, that you want them to be answered, but he does answer all of your prayers. And that's been a struggle in my life because I've been very specific in some of my prayers. And I have learned that I need to be more in my mind praying thy will be done versus what I want done. And that's the hard part because we think we know the better of the outcome, but God knows the better of the outcome. God knows what we need before we ask it. And here they run to the front of the boat and they wake him up. Don't you care that we're dying? Brethren, understand that Ephesians chapter five and verse 16 tells us very clearly that storms are going to come in our lives. That here the writer Paul says that redeem the time because the days that we live in, they're evil. And if you live in an evil world, there are going to be trials that are going to come upon you if you're trying to live a righteous life. You're going to face struggles along the way. And you're going to need to know that through God and through Jesus Christ that we can see to get through those. And I know it's difficult. In Acts chapter 14, there in verse 22, we read that we must through many tribulations, that we must through many trials enter the kingdom of God. But understand this. If you get nothing else today, understand this. God cares. He cares. I believe that God has helped Nancy through this situation because of their great faith in God. And I believe that the Bible, when the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, to cast all your care on Him, for He cares for you. He knows your trial. He knows your trouble. He knows what you're going through. And brethren, you've got to have enough faith to know that just as God and that Jesus had the power to say, peace be still, 
that he has the power to see us through whatever we're going through. Difficult, yes. Is that what we're called to do in the Bible? Yes. The second question that's asked there is he asked them the question, why are you so fearful? How many have ever been afraid? I'm afraid of heights. Funny, a guy 6'8", afraid of heights. I don't like ladders. If you get above my height, I get scared. But that's silly. But how many of you have ever been to a point of fear because you just didn't know how it was going to turn out? That you were faced with a situation in your life and you just wanted to know, how's this going to turn out? And the fear of the unknown. You know, death is fearful. You know why? Because you haven't experienced it. We know people that have, but you as an individual, you have it. So in a sense, death is something that is, is fearful in life. But when you think about what the Bible has to say, and here Jesus says, why is it that you are so fearful? In a sense, he's saying, don't you understand who I am? He goes on to follow that question with this part. He says, how is it that you have no faith? And brother, I'm not saying it's wrong to have fear. I think it's wrong when we allow that fear to lead us to a point that creates doubt in God's ability to help us through what we're going through. I just don't know how people go through things in life without God. I don't know how people keep, and, and I'll just say it this way, I don't know how people keep their sanity when they're going through some kind of trial or, or personal tragedy or personal sickness in their life. I don't know how people get through that without God in their life. Without a hope of a great father who cares about us. Without the hope of life after this with him. I just don't know how people get through life. And here he asks them and almost rebuking them. How come you're so fearful? What are you afraid of? What do you think is going to happen? I've told you I'm the son of man. My work isn't done. Do you really think we're all going to perish here in this boat at this time on this sea? No, we're not. And then he rebukes the wind and everything becomes calm. There have been times in my life where. Renee and I have been gone through something in our life and I'm going to tell you we've sat down and you know we've wondered wow how are we ever going to get through this God how have we how are we ever going to get through this and I can look back on those times now and I know that it was God I know that it was God. I believe sometimes it was because her faith was greater than mine. You know, husbands and wives, listen to me. We all need help in this life. We need help to get to heaven. And there are times when I am weak and she's strong. And that her faith has carried us through situations in life. But our faith together, we're even stronger. To remind each other along the way, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And I can't tell you the number of times that Renee has looked me in the eye and said, pray about it. You just got to pray about it. Just pray about it. I've struggled with prayer in my life. Let me just tell you that. And what I mean by that is there were times where I just felt like I don't know how to pray. That I don't know what to ask for. That I struggle with the idea that the Bible says to pray always. Well, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And, you know, I get 
to that verse and I think, well, you know, that's very point specific and am I righteous enough to pray? And it's taken me a while in my life to mature to a point to where I finally understand that because of what Jesus did in dying on the cross, that I can have forgiveness of sins by being immersed in the watery grave of baptism, that I now have that right or that privilege to be able to communicate with my God in prayer and that he hears those prayers. Some of you are going through things right now that I can't imagine. Some of you are dealing with situations in your personal life, your own personal health, your relationships, your family, your job that I probably can't relate to. But we have one who can. And that's our God. Why are you so fearful? In James chapter 1, and I love the book of James. In James chapter 1, beginning in verse 2, listen to what it says. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Let me ask you this. This is a deep thought question. How many of your faith is to that point? How many of your level of faith is to that point that we find ourselves perfect and complete and lacking nothing? Peter is a great example of one who had everything in his fingertips. And how many times do we find Peter always putting his foot in his mouth to a point to where Jesus would look at him and say, Oh, ye of little faith. I'm going to tell you what, and I've mentioned this before, I never condemn Peter anymore. Because I go on and I read the great things that Peter went on to do. But I don't condemn Peter anymore because I find myself a lot of times where I know he could look at me and say, Oh, ye of little faith. And I am humbled by that. And I'm ashamed by that. And it's almost an awakening in my own life to where I... I tell myself, how can you get up and talk about great faith and how you're in a situation where you're doubting? You're doubting God, O ye of little faith. It kind of wakes you up a little bit, doesn't it? It kind of helps you to realize, wow, all of this is real. All of these stories mean something. These are real events. These are real things that God wants me to understand. And the greatest is how strong is your faith here? Yes, the miracle of calming the sea, but Jesus is teaching us so much more than that is how how strong of a faith do we have? I can tell you this, I know people with great faith. Do you know people with great faith? I don't mean people that you think have great faith, but you know people that have great faith. There's a lady sitting right here that I know has great faith. Putting complete trust in God. We said goodbye to a gentleman yesterday who I believe had great faith. You find yourself in a situation. How's your faith? The third thing that we find mentioned in this story or the third question, and I love this question. There in verse 41, they witness what he's doing. And there it says, you know, Mark writes it this way. They feared exceedingly. What were they afraid of? They weren't afraid of the storm anymore because this follows after Jesus says, 
peace be still. It says, they feared exceedingly and they said to one another, who can this man be? That even the winds and the sea obey him. Brethren, the answer is very simple. He is the son of God. And he does have the power to calm the storms and to deliver every one of us to safety. Now let's understand this. This is the hard part. That doesn't necessarily mean that we'll land safely in this life. But it most certainly 100% assures us that as a faithful child of God, we will land safely in the life to come. And isn't that what matters? Is that what's important in your life? And if you're trading things in this world that you think are so important... If you're living a lifestyle that is so opposed to what God wants us to live, and you think for a moment that you're going to land safely on the other side, you need to almost like they did wake up and realize who is this man. And in a sense, almost drive us to a point of being fearful because the Bible says it's a serious thing to fall into the hands of God. The apostles, even in their teaching, saying, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men to Christ. You know, we talk about the good things of the Bible and our favorite verses. And, you know, all the verses that I love are kind of uplifting and they're beautiful and they make you feel good. And, you know, what's my favorite verse in the Bible? Anybody know? I've been here almost five years and you don't know what my favorite verse is in the Bible. Someone says all of them. You know, my favorite verse in the Bible that I prefer and I read when I'm going through things is John chapter 14. John chapter 14, beginning with verse 1. What's the Bible say there? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. Now, doesn't that make you feel good? Isn't that a beautiful verse that heaven is there and he's preparing a place for us? Wait a minute. A prepared place for a prepared people. How's your faith? Are you prepared? Because on that day we will see the power of God. Unfortunately, there are going to be a lot of folks who are going to have the same response that they did when they saw his power, and they're going to be fearful. You know, the Bible says, every knee shall bow before him. Every eye will behold him. And every tongue will confess him as Lord. We want you to do that now in this life. If we can help you in any way this morning to pray for you. If you need to obey the gospel this morning, the baptistry is ready. We would love to baptize you into the body of Jesus Christ. If we can help you in any way this morning, won't you come as we stand and sing?